Hello, I'm Patricia, and this is the Poetry P Podcast. We live in troubled times, and as a consequence, I'm putting my planned podcast to one side to pose some questions to you that I'm currently struggling with. They revolve around the poetry of war. Most of us listening today will live in relatively peaceful places, we'll have enough food and water, and people will not be dying around us in painful and horrific circumstances. The closest we're going to get to war is watching it on our televisions, hopefully. But many of us will be moved to write of what we see from the comfort of our own homes. And so, primarily my question is this. Can we, with no relationship to war except through the audiovisual tools of our households, write authentic poetry about the theatre of war? David Orr, writing in the New York Times in 2017, suggested that poets do not have to have direct experience of war. But they have to worry about genuineness in a way that they may not when writing about, for instance, sex. I don't know why sex came to his mind except that for an adult audience, it's something we can all write authentically about. He continues, A poet who has never been to Syria invokes the shelling of a Syrian village at the risk of losing, if not angering, the reader. And I find myself agreeing with him. What do you think? Why do we write about war from the comfort of our sofas, from our dining room tables and our sturdy desks? Is it to make a point about the futility, or the consequences, or the destruction of war? Is it to make ourselves feel better? What do we hope to achieve? Perhaps at best we hope that if enough of us pick up a pen, tap enough keys or swipe enough touchscreens and swamp our social media feeds with our poetry, something will happen. War will end. And maybe it's my age, but I see the peace flags on buildings becoming ragged with age. I see the amount of poetry and prose written on the topics of peace and war, and yet, here we are again. There's a poem by a veteran of World War II, Hayden Carruth, that expresses something of this view. It's called On Being Asked to Write a Poem Against the War in Vietnam. Well, I have, and in fact more than one, and I'll tell you this too. I wrote one against Algeria, that nightmare, and another against Korea, and another against the one I was in. And I don't remember how many against the three when I was a boy. Abyssinia, Spain and Harlan County. And not one breath was restored to one shattered throat. Man's, woman's or child's. Not one. Not one. But death went on and on, never looking aside, except now and then with a furtive half-smile to make sure I was noticing. Ultimately, my question is this. Not should we write poetry about war, for that's not for me to say. But can we write meaningful work about something we have no experience of? Can we be authentic? Today, I want to bring you some authentic poetry from people who understand war, who write of war because somehow they have been involved. If you don't want to hear their stories, stories of war from poets who fought or waited at home whilst loved ones fought, or who were in conflict zones, best leave now, because today we're going to explore war poetry. We'll start with poetry from the First World War. You'll all surely know this moving poem by Rupert Brooke, The Soldier made all the more tragic because a short while after he wrote it, he died. I'll just give you an excerpt, and if you go to the show notes, you can click the link to read some more. The Soldier by Rupert Brooke If I should die, think only this of me. 
that there's some corner of a foreign field that is for ever England. There shall be in that rich earth a richer dust concealed, a dust whom England bore, shaped, made aware, gave once her flowers to love, her ways to roam, a body of England's, breathing English air. And Brooke's equally famous counterpart, Wilfred Owen, who also died within touching distance of the end of the war. And this poem, I believe he created whilst in hospital. It's about another of the patients. Disabled by Wilfred Owen He sat in a wheeled chair, waiting for dark, and shivered in his ghastly suit of grey, legless, sewn short at elbow. Through the park, voices of boys rang saddening like a hymn, voices of play and pleasure after day, till gathering sleep had mothered them from him. The poem goes on. In old times, before he threw away his knees, now he will never feel again how slim girls' waists are, or how warm their subtle hands. All of them touch him like some queer disease. Not having learned any lessons from World War I, a mere 21 years later, the world was at it again. World War II. Kenneth Slesser wrote of the results of a battle fought in Egyptian territory. He was an Australian, 37, when the war broke out. His poem, Beach Burial, begins Softly and humbly to the Gulf of Arabs the convoy of dead sailors come. At night they sway and wander in the waters far under. But morning rolls them in the foam. And the poem ends. Dead seamen, gone in search of the same landfall, whether as enemies they fought, or fought with us, or neither. The sand joins them together, enlisted on the other front. And staying in this war, we're going to look at it from another perspective, from that of a young mother. Pamela Holmes, her husband missing, presumed dead in action in December 1942. He has not even seen you, he who gave you your mortality, and you, so small. How can you guess his courage or his loveliness? Yet in my quiet mind I pray he passed you on the darkling way. His death, your birth, so much the same. And holding you, breathed once your name. And before we leave the Second World War, a haiku and monoku. As you can expect, these from a J Japanese perspective. The first by... Takejiro Onishi, who was an admiral in the Imperial Japanese Navy during the Second World War. It's a short poem on the occasion of his death. He committed seppuku after Japan's surrender. Refreshed, I feel like the clear moon after a storm. Refreshed. I feel like the clear moon after a storm. I'm afraid I don't know the translator. And this monoku by Shimamura Hiroshi. I lay her dead body on the roadside. Night dawns early. I lay her dead body on the roadside. 
Night dawns early. Staying in Asia, I'm going to take you next to the Vietnam War in the company of Thai Hadman. Sugarcane fields, the beautiful countryside swarming with snipers. Sugarcane fields, the beautiful countryside swarming with snipers. And this short poem, which was written on his last day in Vietnam while waiting on the airstrip to go home. The crying boy just can't understand why I broke his toy machine gun. The crying boy just can't understand why I broke his toy machine gun. Now we'll go to the Falklands War in 1982. It's the first war that really entered my consciousness. And I want to bring you a poem by Bernie Bruin. He was a commander of an 18-man bomb disposal unit operating on the Falkland Islands during the war. And it comes with this headnote. This poem was written after the horrific night of the 8th of June, 1982, when the casualties from Bluff Cove flooded into the hospital at Red Beach from one direction, and those from HMS Plymouth came from another. My diving team were fully employed looking after the wounded and other survivors, nursing and helping the surgeons in the operating theatre. A sailor from the Plymouth grabbed the attention and admiration of the team. Although badly wounded himself, he was greatly concerned for his oppo, wounded in the head next to him. The poem is called Casualties. The stretched sailor, by his friend whose hand he clasped and willed his pain to mend, in whispers to a medic, raised imploring eyes whose sparkle morphine glazed, said, Help my oppo, please, not me. He's hurting bad, and worse, he cannot see. The stretched sailor, by his friend whose hand he clasped and willed his pain to mend, in whispers to a medic, raised imploring eyes whose sparkle morphine glazed, said, Help my oppo, please, not me. He's hurting bad. And worse, he cannot see. And I'm going to go back to the beginning of the podcast when I quoted David Orr. He said of poets without direct experience of war that they have to worry about genuineness. These poems, by poets with combat experience or direct experience of war like Pamela Holmes, have not had to worry about being authentic. Their voices carry weight because they've lived the experience. If you are a poet without direct experience of war, and you think you can write poetry about war which has this depth, then I encourage you to do it. Do it and get it published. But remember David Orr's sage advice. A poet who has never been to Syria invokes the shelling of a Syrian village at the risk of losing, if not angering, the reader. But by way of airing a different approach... I have one last poem by Abby Murray, who runs the literary journal Collateral. It publishes work concerned with the impact of violent conflict and military service beyond the combat zone. Abby encourages us to create work that explores our experience, how the war affects us. She says we should remember that we are experiencing the war at our own reach, from wherever we are. And she's right that there are few places on earth which can escape the knowledge that wars are going on all around us. Perhaps you can go along and have a look at Abby's journal. I'll put the link in the show notes. So let's finish today with Abby's poem, first published in Rhino 
remembering that Abby is a military wife. Asking for a Friend by Abby E. Murray Is there a way to tell the commander's wife you're a pacifist and it's possible to trust your spouse but mourn his work? Because the death he's delivered through the cracks of thatched rooftops is more than a fracture beneath his skin. And the flag is a reminder, and gravel is a reminder, and pins and ribbons and coins and the smell of diesel and buildings without doors are a reminder. And you won't secure the gold battalion crest over your left breast, no matter how many times she tells you. It's like a sweetheart pin. And the last thing you want when your father is found dead in his duplex is an email asking when she can drop off some meatballs in sauce and you can't stop swaddling your brain in yesterday's times to see what city has fallen, as if they topple rather than burn. And you refuse to stop reading and doubting until no one makes sense and every deployment is a talking head song and every morning is an invitation to dance in a pill bottle. And you're not interested in keeping busy and you don't want more group text. And you don't want your daughter learning to shoot a rifle with the other kids who aim at a silhouette of someone's son tied to a haystack. And you don't want to host a dress swap before the gala And you don't want a souvenir photo with the bald eagle. And every time the commander says, let's thank our ladies, you want to toss the table champagne flutes and all and watch all the favours you've done to prompt his gratitude go flying. Because you've tried to say, war is necessary. But the words are like spiders in the shower. They have every right to be there and yet... You are crawling up the side of yourself, trying to get clean without howling, and you don't want to call them our boys, and you don't want to be called household six, or a rock, or a pillar, and the only commanders you trust are the ones who seem pained by the movement of their own bones given to them by their mothers, freely and without any mental reservation. And it's against your beliefs to say things are fine, when the satellites click and blink above us, unwilling to share which target needs water and which needs bread. And if anyone knows a way to say this, without provoking the commander's wife to roll a wide stone over your spouse and his career, let's meet soon. I'll buy you a beer. Next time I promise you a much more light-hearted podcast. We're going to be enjoying the company of a number of poets who will be reading us some of their split sequences. I thank you for joining me this time. Do send me your thoughts, because this was quite a difficult podcast to put together. Join me next Monday, but until then, keep writing. All the links will be in the show notes. Ciao.